Before we can start talking about the antilipidemics, we have to understand about triglycerides and cholesterol. There's two primary forms of lipids in the blood, water insoluble fats that must be bound to apolipoproteins that are specialized lipid carrying proteins. And lipoprotein is the combination of triglyceride or cholesterol with a polypoprotein. Lipoproteins are then divided into very low density lipoproteins or the VLDLs, low density lipoproteins or LDLs, and high density lipoproteins or HDLs. The VLDLs are produced by the liver and they're they transport endogenous lipids to the cells. The low density lipoproteins are the ones that we always call the bad proteins, the ones that uh, we're trying to get rid of. And those are the ones that tend to cause the atherosclerotic uh, plaques in the vessels. The high density lipoproteins are responsible for recycling cholesterol. So it's also known as good cholesterol. When we look at cholesterol and coronary heart disease, we find that the risk of coronary heart disease in patients with cholesterol levels of 300 milligrams per deciliter is three to four times greater than that in patients with levels that are less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. So we're talking about a huge difference here between 200 and 300. And then remember that the recommendation is that we're sitting around 100 or less. So it tells you that even with the one that's 200, they're not quite as bad off as if they were up higher. Another piece that goes along with this is the fact that inflammation increases the risk of cholesterol causing atherosclerosis. So um, when there is a high CRP number combined with a, a cholesterol level above 200 or 300, it increases the risk of coronary heart disease. National Cholesterol Education Program Adult Treatment Panel uh, 3 wrote the National Institutes of Health, Hyperlipidemia, and Treatment Guidelines. Their recommendations are that antilipemic drugs, which are drugs used to lower lipid levels, be used as an adjunct to diet therapy. Drug choice based on the specific lipid profile of the patient or phenotyping is highly recommended. We know that certain drugs work better for women. We know that certain drugs work better for people of African American descent. We know that there's other um, phenotypically specific drugs that work better for that type of person. All reasonable non-drug means of controlling blood cholesterol levels, in other words, diet and exercise, should be tried for at least six months and found to fail before drug therapy is, is considered. I think this is interesting because um, most people, when they go into their doctor, if they have increased cholesterol levels or their lipid panel in general is high, one of the first things that comes out of the doctor's mouth is, well, let's get you started on a medication. And so I think it's important as nurses that we encourage patients to not only act proactively to prevent hyperlipidemia, but that we also educate our patients to try to change their diet and exercise more so that they really meet these guidelines that were written nationally. Antilipidemics uh, 
The ACC and the AHA guideline on the treatment of blood cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk in adults, which was written in 2013, said that hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A or HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which are HMGs or statins, uh, are one type of medications that we should be using. Bile acid sequizants, uh, B vitamin niacin, uh, which is vitamin B3 or nicotinic acid. Uh, fibric acid derivatives, or we call them fibrates, or cholesterol absorption inhibitors like Zetia, uh, or a combination drug like Vitorin, are drugs that should be used to decrease the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk for adults. One thing I'd like to say about antilipemics and uh, the use of these drugs is that we're starting to see some of these drugs being used in children. And we really don't have studies to show how these drugs affect children long term, but with children having high cholesterol levels um, more and more in our country, we're starting to see treatment being done on younger and younger children. When we look at the antilipemics, probably the most well-known ones are the statins. Uh, we use statins with patients with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We also use it with patients with LDL cholesterol levels above 190 milligrams per deciliter. We also use them with patients that, who have diabetes that are between the age of 40 and 75 with LDL levels of 70 to 189 milligrams per deciliter uh, and without evidence of cardiovascular disease. Basically, we're trying to prevent it from happening with them. Patients without evidence of cardiovascular disease or have diabetes or evidence of diabetes, but who have LDL levels between 70 and 189 and a 10-year risk factor uh, for cardiovascular disease greater than 7.5% are also started on statins. So doctors have these guidelines where, where based on weight, lifestyle, uh, which would be things like how much you exercise, if you smoke, things like that, is a determinant of this number or this percentage risk of developing cardiovascular disease. The mechanism of action for the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors is that they inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, which is used by the liver to produce cholesterol. And by keeping the liver from being able to produce cholesterol, you lower the rate of cholesterol production. Uh, I think it's interesting to note here is that the liver is going to produce cholesterol no matter what you eat. And there really has not been any good studies that showed that eating foods high in cholesterol actually increase your cholesterol. Um, but we still look to decreasing fats as a way of, of decreasing cholesterol. Some of the research that's out there now really shows that a high carbohydrate diet has more to do with the development of cholesterol than eating foods with cholesterol. But several of the antilipemics uh, actually act on this area of the body where it just doesn't allow the liver to have the ability to make cholesterol.
the indications uh, for the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors is that they are the first line drug therapy for hypercholesterolemia. So in other words, for high cholesterol le levels. It's for treatment of type 2A and 2B hyperlipidemias because it reduces the LDL levels by up to 50%. It also increases the HDL levels by 2 to 15 percent. This is one of those things that you need to get really straight in your mind is that LDL we want to be low and HDL we actually want to be high. The good cholesterol we want high levels on that. The low cholesterol we want low or the bad cholesterol, we want low levels on it. And it also reduces triglycerides by 10 to 30 percent. There are some adverse effects associated with the statins and um, there they include things like uh, mild to transient gastrointestinal disturbances, uh, rash, headache, uh, myopathy, mus uh, which is muscle pain, that could possibly lead to a serious condition known as rhabdomyolysis, uh, elevations in liver enzymes or liver disease, and um, in, especially in women, they found memory loss. There's some uh, discussion about whether that actually is something that is a uh, effect or not, but the FDA has required them to put warnings about this memory loss. And I can tell you that when they started me on statins, I was on it for less than two weeks and I started to lose my memory. And it was a really scary thing when you can't remember what you started to say and you're halfway through a sentence and you have no idea where the sentence is going because you don't know where it started. And um, it was unbelievably scary. And other women suffered the same thing some of the research that's out there is actually showing uh, that even when you stop taking the medication that some of that there may be some residual uh, that stays and you never really do get all of your memory back with it but those kind of res those research papers are really being squelched uh, so it's really kind of an interesting uh, information. Rhabdomyolysis, uh, since we mentioned it, let's talk a little bit about it because this isn't the only drug or the only way that uh, you can get the rhabdomyolysis. Uh, basically what it is is a breakdown of muscle protein, um, myoglobinuria, uh, which is urinary elimination of the muscle protein myoglobulin. It can lead to acute renal failure and even death. When recognized reasonably early, rhabdomyolysis is usually reversible by discontinuing the statin drug. We need to instruct our patients to immediately report any signs of toxicity, including muscle soreness or changes in their urine cup color. Another way that people get rhabdomyolysis is um, exercising too much, lifting weights too much. And um, it really is quite a serious uh, problem. Uh, I know of one person that this happened to over the summer and they were hostile you know they were a very healthy person they were doing a lot of weightlifting as part of their exercise routine and it put them in the hospital because the risk of 
of renal failure is so high with it. And they were really, really sick. So just kind of keep that uh, diagnosis in the back of your head because I'm sure you'll hear about it again. When we look at interactions with the statins, uh, there is interactions with the oral anticoagulants. Uh, any drugs that are metabolized by the CYP3A4 uh, system, like erythromycin, the azole antifungals, verapamil, detizem, uh, human immunodeficiency virus, protease inhibitors, uh, amiodarone and grapefruit juice uh, has it, it can affect uh, those drugs as well as those drugs can affect uh, their ability to function as well. One of the more well-known known statins is Lipitor which is Atorovast Statin. So basically, statins end with the word statin, which is why that's that's their classification. One of the it's one of the most commonly used drug in this class of cholesterol lowering drugs. It has some of the uh, least amount of side effects associated with it. It lowers total and LDL cholesterol levels as well as triglyceride levels and raises good cholesterol. Uh, the HDL component. It's dosed once daily, usually with the evening meal or at bedtime, to correlate with your diurnal rhythm. So what we know is that the liver produces more cholesterol at night than it does during the daytime. So most of these antilipemics we give at night so that it is working to prevent that um, release of cholesterol from the liver. A patient with a new prescription for an HMG COA or a statin drug is instructed to take a medication with the evening meal or at bedtime. The patient asks why it must be taken at this time of day and the reason is the medication is better absorbed at this time. This time frame correlates better with the natural diurnal rhythm of cholesterol production. Or C, there will be fewer adverse effects if taken at night instead of with the morning meal. Or D, this timing reduces the incidence of myopathy. And of course, we just talked about this, and so we know that it's B that this time frame correlates better with the natural diurnal rhythm of cholesterol production. The bile acid sequestrants uh, include Questran, Colistid, and Wellcol, or Cholestyramine, Cholestpol, or Colabeslem. Uh, so if you look at them, um, instead of having the similar name at the end of the word, it's at the beginning of the word, and we see the coal or the coli, which implies cholesterol. And um, it's, these are also called bile acid binding resins or ion exchange resins. So if you were ever to to look up in research to find out about, about these meds, you would probably want to use all three of these names to look up articles about them because you would find some researchers referring to them one way and other researchers re referring them to another way. The mechanism of action for bile acid sequest is that they present they prevent resorption of bile acids from the small intestines and the bile acids are necessary for absorption of cholesterol so if you don't have the bile acids there then you can't 
absorb the cholesterol. So again, we're acting on keeping the cholesterol out of your system in the first place. Indications for these medications include type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia, the relief of pruritus that's associated with partial biliary obstruction, uh, especially the use of the drug cholestyramine. The other thing I want you to remember is pruritus means itching, uh, so that you uh, understand what we're saying as we're going along here. These drugs can also be used with statins, so you sort of get uh, two ways of reducing uh, the lipid levels. So of course they have adverse effects, and if you think about the fact that you're keeping cholesterol from being absorbed, that means that the cholesterol is sitting in the, in the in the bowel, and so some of the adverse effects include constipation, heartburn, nausea, belching, bloating. Think about how you feel after eating a, a high-fat meal. Uh, these adverse effects tend to disappear over time, but obviously they're really bad when you first start taking these medications. Increasing dietary fiber intake or taking a fiber supplement like psyllium, which is like uh, Metamucil, and then there's other names for, for the same thing, as well as increasing your fluid intake may help relieve constipation and bloating. So if you think about it with constipation, we tell people to increase their fluids because that helps the bowels to move a little bit better. When you're dehydrated, you tend to get constipated. Uh, also, it can cause mild increases in the triglyceride levels, which is kind of interesting since it's bringing down the cholesterol levels. Some of the things that we need to think about when patients are are going to be on bile acid sex sequestrants are uh, that an overdose can cause obstruction because the bile acid sequestrants are not absorbed. Uh, they stay in the bowel. Uh, that has another thing to do with why there's uh, constipation. Uh, treatment at overdose includes restoring gut motility. Uh, as far as drug interactions go, all drugs have to be taken at least an hour before or four to six hours after the administration of bile acid sex sequestrants. Uh, high doses of bile acid sequestrant decrease the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, so any of those vitamins that you're eating are not going to be absorbed if you've taken those foods in in that time period between one to four hours after the, medic, after the bile acids uh, sequestrants have been taken. Uh, so that can definitely affect your levels of those fat-soluble vitamins. Cholestyramine, or Questran, is one of the drugs that we think about when we think about these particular medications. Contraindications would be a known hypersensitivity or if they have phenylketonuria. Uh, or PKU. Pregnancy and lactation is something that we have to think about because remember again it affects your absorption of those fat soluble vitamins and those are needed for the baby to grow normally not only uh, for their size but also for their brain and organ development.
Also, we need to, uh, it can, um, it can be used as a treatment for loose bowel movements, and we need to have caution when administering the dry powder. I th what's interesting to me is uh, Questrin is off. It is used by at least some of the neonatologists that I work with as a um, paste uh, with desitin for kids behind where when they're where they're when their bottoms get really, really raw. And we see that a lot with our patients that have, um, whose mothers did drugs and now the baby's withdrawing from the drugs. They get really bad diarrhea and it breaks down their skin really bad. So it's interesting that within the adult community that these medications are, are used for the treatment of loose bowel movements. Uh, the dry powder needs to be mixed in at least four to six milliliters of fluid. And if for some reason the patient can't get it to dissolve, uh, they, they should not take it as a dry uh, powder. Uh, they always have to have some kind of liquid, liquid with it. Remember, this stuff can cause constipation. So uh, it can it can't if they can't get it to dissolve in their liquids, then they could mix it with their food, or they could mix it with fruit. Uh, but normally we want them to mix it with water. A patient has been ordered the powdered form of the bile acid sex sequestrant uh, cholestipol. Which of the following does the nurse identify as true? The nurse should have the patient swallow the dose of cholestipol powder one teaspoon at a time. B. The powder should be dissolved and immediately administered. C. Cholestipol should be administered one hour before or four to six hours after any other oral medication. Or D. Cholestipol should be administered with meals. Well, we've talked about this when we were talking about this group of drugs as a whole, and it should be administered one hour before or four to six hours after any other oral medication. It's important that cholesterol and any bile acid sequestrant be taken an hour before, four to six hours after any other oral medication or meals because of the high risk of drug-to-drug -drug and drug-to-food interaction. The powder should be dissolved for one full minute before administration and should not be taken in dry form. If it does not dissolve well, it can be mixed with food or fruit and should be mixed uh, in at least four to six ounces of fluids. Niacin, or nicotinic acid, is vitamin B3. It has lipid-lowering properties, but requires much higher doses than when it's used as a vitamin. It's effective, inexpensive, and it's often used in combination with other lipid-lowering drugs. They aren't really sure what the mechanism of action is, but they think that it increases the activity of lipase, which breaks down lipids. It reduces the meta metabolism or catabolism of cholesterol and triglycerides. The indications for niacin is effective in lowering the triglyceride, the serum uh, cholesterol on the LDL levels, uh, it increases the HDL levels, and it's effective in tre treating types 2A, 2B, 3, 4, and 5 hyperlipidemias. In addition, it may be used 
if statins have had too many other side effects. However, <laughs> niacin has a pretty nasty side effect and the side effect that's the worst with it is flushing and it's caused by histamine release. And if you look at this picture here, this is what this guy's color looks like normally on the left. And then when he takes his niacin, the flushing turns him bright red as though he was having, had been out in the sun and had a horrendous sunburn. It also causes pruritus, which is itching, and GI distress. So when I didn't tolerate my statin, my doctor was quite determined that I needed to be on something for my cholesterol. And so she put me on niacin. Um, the niacin that they give you is not the basic over-the-counter niacin uh, that you just buy off the counter in the pharmacy. It's a long-acting form of niacin. So what would happen is that I would all of a sudden have this burning feeling coming across my body and it literally would start at the top of my head and I could, this picture of the guy that looks sunburned, I could literally see a line going down my body as my body turned this bright red and it would go all the way down to my feet. And it would stay like that for a few minutes and then it would go away. But it would happen three or four or five times a day. And it felt like I was on fire when it happened. I don't remember a lot of itching except during the flushing periods and then I would feel itchy with that. So if you think about the fact that the flushing is caused by histamine release, then it makes sense that the itching would come up during the, the flushing periods of time. So here's another question for you. A patient will be taking niacin as part of an antilipemic therapy. The best way to avoid problems with flushing or pruritus would be to A, take the medication at bedtime, B, take the medication with a small dose of steroid, C, take the medication with a full glass of water on an empty stomach, or D, start with a low initial dose and then increase it gradually. So let's take this question apart. Well, we already know that we're going to take it at bedtime because that's when our body's making the most lipid. And so we want to work on it not making so much. So then we look at taking it with a, a small amount of steroid. Well, if I take steroids, it's going to affect a lot of other parts of my body other than just the lipid areas. Taking the medication... Uh, with a full glass of water and an empty stomach, that's really not going to do a whole lot of good for us either. So normally what happens with niacin, these long-acting niacins is they start you on a low initial dose and then they increase you to the level that actually provides a therapeutic response. Uh, so D is the correct answer. Cutaneous flushing may be minimized if the niacin is started at a smaller dose and then gradually increased. The other thing that can help with it is if you pre-medicate with a small dose of aspirin or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug about 30 minutes before taking the niacin, that may help uh, to uh, not get so, many, so much of the flushing as well. Uh, also, if you take the niacin with meals, it may help to maximize, uh, minimize rather, those undesirable effects. The mechanism of action for the uh, 
fibric acid derivatives is that they believe they work by activating lipase, which breaks down cholesterol. It also is believed that it suppresses the release of free fatty acid from adipose tissue. It inhibits the synthesis of triglycerides in the liver and increases secretion of cholesterol in the bile. Like most of the ones we've looked at already, uh, it has specific uh, in indications. And this one is uh, good for treatments of type 3, 4, and 5 hyperlipidemias. And I want to say right now, I'm not worried about which type of hyperlipidemias uh, they may treat. Uh, that's not going to be something that I test on. Uh, because basically I just need you to know that these are the different types of medications to bring down uh, the hyperlipidemias. The fibric acid derivatives, uh, gymfibrozil and phenofibrate, decrease triglyceride levels and increase HDL cholesterol levels by as much as 25%. So not as much as the statins, but still a fairly good amount. The contraindications, of course, include no known drug allergies, but also severe liver or kidney disease, cirrhosis, or gallbladder disease. The adverse effects associated with fibric acid derivatives include abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, and nausea. Remember, it's affecting these things in the gut. Uh, it can also cause blurred vision and headache, uh, an increased risk of gallstones, prolonged prothrombin time, and liver studies may show increased enzyme levels. And of course, there's an interaction with other drugs. Oral anticoagulants, statins. With the statins, it increases the risk of myocyt myocytis, uh, myalgias, and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, lab test reactions, uh, it can decrease, show a decreased hemoglobin level. Uh, hematocrit values and white blood cell count. It may cause an increase in activated clotting time. Uh, LDL, uh, the lactate dihydrogenase level, and uh, bilirubin levels. Newer antilipimics is a cl cholesterol absorption inhibitor uh, known as estimibib or Zetia. It inhibits the absorption of cholesterol and related sterols from the small intestines. Uh, it results in reduced total cholesterol, LDL, and triglyceride levels. It also increases HDL levels. It's often combined with a statin drug and it can be used as a monotherapy. In fact, it often is used as a monotherapy. My most recent experience with antilipimics uh, was with Zetia. So I want you to think about these words when we say it inhibits absorption of cholesterol from the small intestines. Uh, because we also noticed that with a couple of the other medications. So if you aren't absorbing those fats from your gut into your bloodstream and into your tissues, then it stays in your gut. <laughs> and so what tends to happen with people with this is they get fatty stools or diarrhea and, um, but I will tell you that it did reduce my total cholesterol. It did bring down my LDL and uh, my triglyceride levels. 
However, and it did slightly increase my HDL. Um, but the side effects to my gut was something that I really did not want to deal with. And after about six months of it, I said, no way. And uh, that's been out of my system for a while now. But uh, so when your patients start talking about those kinds of symptoms, think about what's happening, how the drug is working in the body to reduce these, these levels. And then it's going to lead you to why the side effects are happening. Some of you probably already know this, but garlic, uh, when it's used as an, uh, can be used as an antispasmodic, an antihypertensive, an antiplatelet, uh, and a lipid reducer. Uh, so here's a really nice natural way of bringing down all of those things. Uh, the adverse effects with garlic is dermatitis, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, and antiplatelet activity. And anyone who's ever eaten a good uh, meal with a lot of garlic in it will know that this flatulence is not just minor flatulence, and it's usually pretty stinky as well. There are possible interactions between garlic and warfarin and diazepam. Uh, it may enhance bleeding when it's taken with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Because remember, it has an antiplatelet action. So you take it with another drug that has antiplatelet actions, it uh, po will potentiate it. So a patient wants to take garlic tablets to improve his cholesterol levels. Which condition would be contra in a contraindication? Hypertension, a bowel obstruction, sinus infection, or scheduled surgery? Well, let's look at each one of them. People take garlic tablets to not only improve cholesterol levels, but also to decrease blood pressure. So that would not be a contraindication. Bowel obstruction, if you got bowel obstruction, we got to do something about it that it has nothing to do with garlic. It just means we need to get you in and get that obstruction taken care of so that you're not obstructed anymore. And garlic or no garlic, it's, it's a bad uh, thing going on. Sinus infection actually is somewhat improved by garlic and onions and things like that, so no, that wouldn't be a contraindication. However, the antiplatelet act activity of garlic makes it something that you don't want to be taking if you have scheduled surgery coming up. So if they're undergoing surgery within two weeks, or somebody who has HIV infection or diabetes, you don't want to take garlic tablets for your uh, cholesterol level or your hypertension for that matter. So here's another natural product and that's flax. Both the seed and the oil of flax are used. Uh, it's used to reduce atherosclerosis, hypercholesterolemia, GI distress, and menopausal symptoms. It may cause diarrhea, and uh, for those that have allergic problems, it may cause allergies. There are possible interactions with flax with anti-diabetic drugs and anticoagulant drugs. Another herbal product is omega-3 fatty acids. These are usually fish oil products 
and they're used to reduce cholesterol. They may cause rash, belching, and allergic reactions, and there's potential interactions with other anticoagulant drugs. The other thing that you need to think about as far as the uh, fish oils are concerned is that some people genetically have no results from taking fish oil. Uh, in fact, I was talking with Dr. Melius the other day, and she was telling me that there actually is quite a bit of research out there now that shows that there really is little to no effect from fish oil products. And now it's time to look at the nursing implications for these um, antilipemic drugs. Before beginning therapy, you want to obtain a thorough health and medication history, just like any other drug. You want to assess dietary patterns, exercise level, weight, height, vital signs, tobacco and alcohol use, and family history. Remember, these dietary patterns and exercise levels are things that can be modified if the patient so deci decides to do that rather than just taking a pill for it. You want to assess for contraindications and conditions that require cautious use and drug interactions. Contraindications include biliary obstruction, liver dysfunction, and active liver disease. Almost every one of these medications can cause liver dysfunction. And so liver functions have to be checked regularly when patients are taking these drugs. You want to obtain those baseline liver function studies because you need to know whether this is something that was already existing in this patient or if this is something that has developed as a result of their medication use. Patients on long-term therapy may need supplemental fat-soluble vitamins, specifically A, D, and K. And those are available over-the-counter. Question. Which patient would benefit from administration of Simvastin, or Zocor, 80 milligrams? A patient newly diagnosed with hyperlipidemia? A patient with muscle aches who is taking another antilipemic drug? Or C, a patient who is taking Verapamil? Or D, a patient who has already been taking Simvastin, or Zocor, for 12 months with no evidence of myopathy? The D, the answer is D. And the rationale for this is that in 2011, the Food and Drug Administration imposed new prescribing re restrictions on Simvastin, stating physicians should limit using the 80 milligram dose unless patients have already been taking the drug for 12 months and there's no evidence of myopathy. Simvastin 80 milligrams should not be started in new patients, including patients already taking lower doses of the drugs. In patients taking verapamil, the dose of Simvastin is not to exceed 10 milligrams. Some more implications. We need to refer to guidelines regarding administration times and meals. They do vary from drug to drug, although they do tend to be given more likely in the evenings. Counsel patients concerning diet and nutrition on an ongoing basis. Even though they're taking these medications that do improve their uh, cholesterol levels, changing diet and increasing exercise will also help to bring down those levels. Powder forms must be taken with a liquid, mixed thoroughly but not stirred, and never taken dry. Other medications should be taken one hour before or four to six hours after meals to avoid interference with absorption. 
to minimize adverse effects of niacin, start on a low initial dose and gradually increase it and take with meals. Uh, going back to this one about the other medications, uh, the one slide seemed to imply that the actual medication needed to be taken uh, an hour before to or four to six hours after meals, uh, but it's the other medications, not the uh, lipid reducing ones. So here's our last question. Before administering niacin, it is most important for the nurse to assess the patient for A, allergy to erythromycin, B, gout, C, coronary artery disease, or D, hypothyroidism. The answer on this one is B, gout. With niacin, patients Patient assessment, including noting contraindications such as liver disease, peptic ulcer disease, gout, hypertension, and any active bleeding is very important. Although a thorough assessment of all patient conditions is helpful, the other conditions do not preclude the use of niacin. Small doses of aspirins or NSAIDs may be taken 30 minutes before niacin to minimize the cutaneous flushing. You want to provide teaching regarding the use of NSAIDs and aspirins when used with various uh, medications since there is an interaction and some antiplatelet activity with some of the medications. Inform patients that these drugs may take several weeks to show effectiveness. So don't expect things to suddenly change in just a couple days. Instruct patients to report persistent GI upset, constipation, abnormal or unusual bleeding, and yellow discoloration of the skin. So just remember, we're looking for liver problems when we see those, those symptoms. Monitor for adverse effects, including increased liver enzyme studies and monitor for therapeutic effects like reduced cholesterol and triglyceride levels. And that concludes our discussion of the antilipimics. Have a good day.